Next one, grinding or humping with clothes on, aka dry sex, dry humping, dry grinding. Is it sex, not sex? I'm sure. Middle school me and adult me still don't know the answer to this. I don't know. I agree. <laughs> Retweet. No. Oh. Anyone want to tell okay, us? Well, I feel like. <laughs> At this point, I'm relating everything to the Mariah bubble, and these are one of the things on the periphery of the Mariah bubble. Very close periphery of the Mariah bubble, but <laughs> I don't know that it's in the bubble. So I don't know. Because I think it's a very intimate thing to do. Like, it's a very, like, very, like, a very intimate way to be with somebody, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. And, and I'm unsure because I think you brought this up before, Cassidy, but people and students in my workshops bring this up of, of being like, well, culturally, like whining and other forms of dancing are technically like clothes on, but bumping our genitals together. And so is that is that form of dance sex? So that's also where I am unsure. That to me is, I know that answer easily. That's no, but I don't know. I guess it's a bias for me culturally. I guess that's a, a bias for me. But I also feel like dancing like that with somebody is not grinding with somebody like in a private space. Mm. Like, like, and I'll just speak from like experience. That's, it's, it's almost like for me, you can clarify the difference. Like if this is something you are comfortable doing, like in front of your family and your friends, that might be the delineating difference between something that might be more intimate and something that might be more culturally accepted and everybody's at carnival and we're dancing and we're having fun. Like that, I feel like in my head, I can see the difference. I don't know if I'm obviously not saying it, like, I know I'm not being clear, no, that makes but sense. there's something, about, not to like, not to incite shame around it because that's not what I want to do, but there's this, I don't know, like, I'm hearing that just the intent is different. If your intention is to dance with somebody and you're comfortable doing that in front of friends, family, in a club, wherever, like your intent is probably very different than the intent you might have with a partner in a private space. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's a difference between things that are sexy, um, things that are like, in the realm of flirtation like to me um yeah puerto rican pereo like we like that, that can purely be social and cultural like you can be out with the person you're dating and then both be on the dance floor like grinding with other people but you know if somebody were to do it in a, in a way that then you'd be having an argument about it but like um yeah dancing can be sexy um sexual harassment sexual assault can still happen on a dance floor with clothes on um but just grinding with someone, um, for me, it's it's a, it's sexy, but it's not sex. Um, I'm glad you both mentioned that, also because it brings up an opportunity opportunity to talk about racism and um, what we think of, and and sex and sex ed, because some of these dance forms that we're talking about, like John, you brought up like style of Puerto Rican dancing. Um, we might have yeah. assumptions about black and brown people being more sexual than white people. That is a, a racist stereotype that is out there. I can't think of a white cultural dance that is genitals bumping and grinding, but that doesn't mean that having but like that 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 form of dance is inappropriate. It's not inappropriate. It's bodies moving in space. It's a valid form of art, a form of dance, a form of socializing, like Cassie said, like carnival, like families and friends there. But um, even dance can bring up racism in terms of like sex and sexuality. I don't know if anyone else wants to add on to that. I think there have definitely been, or rather, I guess the way that Black bodies, the, the black bodies of women are interpreted, particularly in media. Um, and what is, at least when I think about it, like what is considered okay. And in terms of sexualizing young black and brown bodies a lot younger than we do, or the protection of young black and brown bodies are treated a lot differently than the, you know, their white counterparts. And so understanding how that translates when we talk about things like advocacy, um, 
incarceration um, in terms of like the LGBTQ community and folks of color within that community and what that looks like. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> and like, just even, you know, thing about like the culture of like dance floors, like our kids are going to get older and like get them going down the dance floors and whatnot. But like, there's still codes around it. There's still consent. You know, like you can be at a party where it's like, it's hot and steamy and everybody's grinding, but there's still like consent being worked out. There's still body language codes and things can be violated. And there can be like, you know, uh, conflicts about that. Um, so, you know, being, being grounded in consent, coming from a place of wanting people free and safe, um, and nobody doing or anything happening that they're not okay with. Um, and if you're kind of coming from that place, like, I think it's easier to not step on boundaries, um, and to, and to manage that better when you do, you know, you're like, I'm sorry. I also do think, um, John, to what you were saying, I do think that much like, any other life scenario if you think about catcalling i think in any space people can sexually harass someone or sexually assault someone and so being mindful of again what that consent looks like um particularly if you are dancing with somebody and you know even if body language tells you that they might not be comfortable that is a way to check in you know so i, I think it's important to not just think that just because one type of dancing though it may be sexy that there's no room to clarify for things like sexual harassment or sexual assault because it can definitely happen there as well even you know even in spaces where it might be more obvious to see it i guess for lack of better words but they definitely it can happen anywhere to anyone and just understanding that the rules and the rules or consent are, are exactly the same mm -hmm. in most places so yeah totally agree yeah um it's almost like uh once the a lot of people think that just because the dance floor is uh, dance floor is popping and the music is fire that consent goes out the window but there's definitely a responsibility to check in with the people that you're dancing with um and then i do think that there is almost like a there's a hypersexualization of um these different types of dances be it you know like um be it perreo, be it cumba, be it merengue, bachata, a salsa, all of these dances, um, a rumba, like even like a, like any like soca, all, all these um, different types of music and dances. There is an, like an exotification that goes into it, um, and almost like a, a hypersexuality that goes into, especially like the, the women performing these dances. Um, but consent carries into all rooms. There's no, there's no different, be it a dance floor, be it around the dinner table. <laughs> there's always going to need to be that um, check-in, that constant check-in. So, yeah. And that also goes into how you approach a partner, like, on the dance floor. <laughs> Make sure that the person that you dance with actually wants to dance with you, please. Yeah, shout out to Bad Bunny. Like, he made a song, Yo Pareo Sola. It's about a woman who's dancing on the dance floor. And, like, she's like, I'm, I'm being sexy by myself. Am I sexy? Is it about you? So leave me, to, leave me alone. And that's what the, the song is basically about. And he's saying, like, when she wants to dance with you, she'll call you over, you know? Um, and I think that's a really good reminder. And it's pretty dope that it came from the number one artist in the world right now. But, uh. <laughs> I, want be, um, I want to be mindful that, like, I think we're having great discussion, but we're also using a lot of vocabulary that people might not be familiar with. So when we talk about things like, heteronormativity or heterosexism or exotification or hypersexualization that we talk about what those things mean and not just like gloss over them so we don't lose folks so yeah so should we have should we record a little bit defining hypersexualization i think that's a good word to clarify because we do that i just wanted to be mindful of the language that we were using but how about i'll play dumb and i'll say like what's hypersexualization <laughs> okay cool Sorry, when you're um, not chewing. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Three. Um, so I have, wait, what's, what's hypersexualization? I'm not sure that's a word everybody knows. Great question. Um, hypersexualization is, in my mind, making, um, taking someone and or a, 
have to edit this out. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> well, maybe start with sex. Sexualizing. Sexualization like in the, the to, to sexualize someone. Okay, this is me. this is my signal. Do it again, John. Say it again. Okay. Um, so uh, a word was thrown out that I think would be helpful to clarify. Um, so what's hypersexualization? Maybe we start with just sexualization. What's the difference? Sexual and then hypersexual. So I would say that if you are sexualizing something or someone, um, you are kind of putting that person in like a sexual light. You're looking at them or thinking about them in a sexual way when they might, you know, not necessarily be like trying to put those vibes out. Mm. Um, and like, I'm just going to jump in and like all forms of oppression, um, you can sexualize someone on an interpersonal level. You can sexualize a group of people. Um, a, a institution can sexualize a group of people or a person. So it can happen on different, different levels just to hop in. Um, I just wanted to throw in an example, Eliza. So like, for example, if someone is being really nice to you. Maybe you're like new somewhere or something and someone is being really nice to you. It doesn't mean that they're interested in you. Sexually, they might just be nice to you. And so not interpreting that behavior as something that might be, that might mean something more than it does. Or like two, two people are talking and then one person starts pushing the conversation sexual. They're like sexualizing the conversation and not doing it to the other person. And then a, a form of sexualization that really annoys me is we do it with little kids. Like we'll see like a little kid, we'll start asking them about like, girlfriends and boyfriends and you're a heartbreaker and this and that it's like talking to a four-year-old like why are you sexualizing they're not thinking about relationships like they're not an adult they don't have adult mind um so it happens in a lot of different ways but yeah like the, the caribbean you know like culture, different cultures might express themselves around sex, sex and have a different relationship to sex in that way um and then from a different perspective that it can be hypersexualized, even though it might just actually be a different understanding and relationship to our body and to relationships um, but then from a more, let's say, conservative culture, that could be like, everything's about sex when it's just, we just, we just approach it differently. Mm -hmm. And I would say that like, right, there's nothing like being sexual is like not a bad thing, right? If you, like you are, if you want to be sexual, but if you are pushing like sexuality onto somebody else um, in a way that they have not agreed to then that's when it starts to become a problem. Right. So if we go back to John's example of when sometimes what we've normalized as a culture in general of asking little kids, oh, I bet you have so many boyfriends at school or so many girlfriends. Like we've made that kind of normal. Um, the reason that we might want to stop doing that and why it's considered sexualization is that a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, or, or an eight-year-old um, might not be thinking about crushes or like dating or having romantic feelings. And we as adults or teenagers or older people are assuming something and making just sort of their appearance or their life about being in relationship to someone else. Um, so we're not maybe necessarily thinking of that little kid having sex, which would be something different completely. But sexualization happens, yes, like Eliza said, when um, you're non-consensually kind of putting people into relationship with something without, yeah, without their consent. Yeah, and this is also making me think of another word that was thrown out earlier by me, which is heterosexist and heterosexism. And the way that we, like, sexualize children is often through a very heterosexist lens, which is just the assumption that they're heterosexual and the assumption that like everyone is heterosexual. So we're imposing those roles on them as well before they've even really had time to, to explore their own sexuality or to advocate for their own sexuality. We're pushing them into these little boxes. Um, and to be heterosexual means like to be straight. 